Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Bordoni, Director of Strategic Alliance Development at Bristol Myers Squibb. On behalf of Alliance and the US Policy and Government Affairs team, I'd like to welcome you to the Bristol Myers Squibb Virtual Policy Forum. Before I turn it over to our Head of Corporate Affairs, Michelle Weiss, I'd like to review some quick housekeeping items. While we are in Zoom webinar mode, we'd still like to interact with you throughout the session. So please feel free to use the chat box to chat with us and also enter your questions in the Q&A box for the Q&A portion at the end of the panel discussion. We are offering closed caption during today's session. If you'd like to turn it on at the bottom of your screen, click live transcript and then select show subtitle. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Weiss, Executive Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Bristol Myers Squibb. Michelle? Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Here at Bristol Myers Squibb, we're honored to partner with patients and advocacy organizations to drive public policy efforts that improve insurance benefit design, um, enhance access, and lower out-of-pocket costs for patients. We know that's important for all of your audiences. Policy issues impacting patients are discussed in lots of different capacities every day on, on Capitol Hill, at the White House, in state houses across the country. And as a patient advocate, you're an indispensable part of our democratic system, and your voice is critical to the lawmakers who represent us. So telling your story makes an impact and helps change and improve lives. I mean, whether you're a, a patient, a family member, a caregiver, a healthcare provider, or an advocacy organization, you make a difference. Policymakers often cite the voices of constituents and advocates as examples of why policies should change. And so your voice and actions help them better understand the impact that healthcare policies have on patients. So building a strong relationship with your elected official and their staff is an important aspect of advocacy. And effective communication with elected officials is a key element. So that's really why we're so excited to have you joining us for today's event. Our legislator roundtable discussion will provide an opportunity for you to hear directly from sitting legislators as they provide their insights on effective advocacy strategies and the process of engaging with elected officials. Our panelists will provide tips on information they seek to learn when meeting with advocates. They'll give firsthand examples of advocacy campaigns that have impacted their decision making. And then they'll give guidance on virtual advocacy engagement and advice for any advocate looking to get involved in the legislative process. So we really hope you enjoy today's conversation. And to everyone in attendance, thank you for making your voices heard. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman. BMS is proud to have three facilities based in her district in New Jersey, representing almost 5,000 employees. Hi everyone. Thank you, Michelle and BMS for hosting this discussion. I'm Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman from New Jersey's 12th Congressional District. I wanna thank you for inviting me here today. And I want to acknowledge Assemblymember Adam Talaferro. I understand that you all will hear from some excellent state reps, including my friend Shavonda Sumter. But I wanted to take a moment to give you my perspective on the work you all do and its impact on federal legislation. I think we all understand the importance of patient advocacy. I've heard that there are over 1,200 healthcare lobbyists on Capitol Hill, and the healthcare industry spends tremendous amounts of money to make sure their interests are heard. In the first six months of 2021, they spent over $330 million doing just that. Now, not all that money is nefarious. Much of it helps to educate members on some of the latest in research and where the future of medicine lies. Much of that work is done right here in my district, and we're very proud to be the medicine cabinet of the world. But what can be lost in all of that noise are the voices of patients, which is why your work is so important. Your work advocating for patients on the ground level is vitally important. If all legislators hear the voices of the powerful, even the best, most well-meaning legislators, those who think of themselves as advocates can miss details that hurt patients. You are educators, watchdogs, 
policy experts, as well as advocates. I also want to encourage patients themselves to reach out to their elected officials. I can tell you it's one thing to hear from a representative from an organization. It's quite another to hear directly from a constituent. So please, call your senators or representatives. Tell your story. Make sure you are heard. Be personal in a way that connects on a human level. There is a person on the other side of the phone, whether it's a policy staffer or a constituent service representative. There is a human being who can hear you and empathize with you. Don't be afraid to share, or worse yet, assume that Congress or your state house is some impenetrable fortress. Officers are made up of people who come to work every day to make their country a better place. Use that to your advantage and help them understand how. Thank you again for having me. Enjoy the rest of the panel. God bless. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, for those, those fantastic remarks. My name is Adam Talaferro, and I'm a director of strategic alliances at BMS, and I'm a member of uh, our, our team of four, which is also includes Grant Kale, Sherelle McDermott, and Dimitri Siegel. I am super excited today to moderate our panel with our three state legislators. In addition to my role at BMS, I also served in the New Jersey state legislature uh, for the past seven years. And I want to apologize in advance. Because when I'm talking to my, my legislative friends, I'm going to say us, we, and I am no longer a member of the legislature, but it's still embedded in my mind. So without further ado, I want to introduce our, our three state legislators. Uh, first, we're going to start with Senator Laura Fine. Senator Laura Fine is serving her first full term as a state senator of the 9th District in Illinois, which encompasses Chicago's northern suburbs. Prior to serving in the Senate, Senator Fine served as a state representative for the 17th district for six years. Senator Fine lives in Glenview with her husband, Michael, and has two sons. Senator Fine, thank you so much for joining us today. Next up, we have Senator Tim Knope. Senator Knope was elected to his first term in the Oregon State Senate in November of 2012. He was elected Dem Deputy Republican Leader in 2014 and elected Senate Minority Leader in 2021. Senator Knope represents District 27, which encompasses communities in Central Oregon. Senator Knope and his wife, Melissa, have been married for 34 years and have four children and two grandkids. Senator, thank you so much for joining us today as well. And finally, last but not least, Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter. Assemblywoman Sumter entered the New Jersey General Assembly in 2012 she has served in the executive leadership as deputy speaker and majority conference leader. Assemblywoman Sumter currently represents the 35th legislative district that includes parts of Bergen and Passaic County. The Assemblywoman has been married for 22 years to her husband, Kenneth, and together they have a daughter, Tyler, and a son, Kenneth. She continues to work hard with a purpose because she believes to whom much is given, much is required. To our legislative uh, roundtable members, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and to those that uh, are, are joining us, are the advocates that are joining us today, this is such a unique opportunity uh, to, to hear from three sitting legislators. So I wanna start our conversation today. To just get your perspective. If I can ask uh, the three of you to give me a, a minute or two on when we talk about the patient advocacy voice, what does that mean to you in the work that you do? So if we could start with Senator Fine, can you just give us uh, some brief remarks on, on what the patient advocacy voice means to the work that you do? That's a really good question. The patient advocacy voice is the reason we get things done. When people tell us their stories and the impacts of their stories and how change would be helpful for their health and well-being, that's how we can react and make sure that the laws in our state reflect what's best for them. And so it's very important for people to share their stories with us, to, to put us on the track to do what's right. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kano, uh, how about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I think it's really important that uh, advocates connect with legislators in their home districts. Um, lots of times it's important during your advocacy that you've built that relationship with the legislator before your issue comes up. So we recognize your story your, and the efforts that you're trying to put in 
to pass whatever legislation it is that you're working on. Because if you start from day, you know, if you start from day one, when the, the legislation is introduced, everybody knows it, uh, it takes a long time to move something through uh, a legislative body. So uh, critically important, those relationships get built in the months and years prior to your activity. So that uh, we know each other and uh, I think it makes it that much easier because we know your story, we know what you're about and it helps us to be able to advocate for you. Thank, thank you so much, Senator. And, and Assemblywoman, uh, can, you, can you round us out? Uh, thank you, thank you. And Adam, always good to see you and to the senators uh, on the call. Uh, so I, I have a healthcare background over 20 years. Uh, so the patient voice focused on mental health uh, is my background is critical. We don't know everything. I know people like to think as legislators, we are just, you know, so brilliant. We're the experts in every area. Uh, and as our Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman stated earlier, it really is the patients that help to drive our democracy. Uh, looking at patient bill of rights, parity in mental health and medical care all came about from patients elevating their voices with uh, not only our federal legislators, but also state legislatures. It's important that we have these relationships so we know how we can bridge the gap and break down barriers for a healthy society. And it only happens by us hearing from the patients directly. Thank you, Adam. Uh, th thank you, Assemblywoman. So, uh, you know, to, to our legislative panelists, you know, on the, on the webinar today, we have some very seasoned advocates and we have some folks that are just wanting to get engaged, but don't know how to. And it could be a daunting task to, to come before a legislator and, and tell your story and, and seek to make an impact. So now I wanna pull the curtain back a little bit. And you know, when you have an, an advocate that walks into your office and, and is coming to meet with you, can you just tell me two or three things that you're looking to, to get from that advocate? You know, A lot of us talk about the power of the patient voice. You hear about statistics, you, you hear so many different things. From your viewpoints, can you just give us a, a couple of things that you really seek when you're having that, that, that first meeting with an advocate? And, and Senator uh, Knope, can we start with you on that? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I, what I'm looking for is number one, I wanna, I wanna hear your story. And I, you know, I wanna know what it is that's driving you on that particular issue. And um, I think stories are the most important thing in terms of connecting with people because this business is really about relationships and that's where success lies. However, I'm also a Republican. So facts and figures are really important to me as well. Is it gonna save money? Is it going to, you know, how many people is it going to help? What's it gonna cost? And you know, I wanna I want to get to the bottom line because I wanna know what's, what's doable. Uh, everybody uh, that's on this call, that's a legislator is working within a budget. Uh, a state budget, and we know how much money we have to spend, and you know where can we fit your issue in? Because if there's two things that I know, uh, people approach me about spending more money on a certain program and regulating something. So those are the two things that we get asked to do every day. And so, what makes your issue stand out? And you know, get to the bottom line. If we're in session, um, you know, we're doing 15-minute appointments, and maybe we're doing. 10 to 20 of those a day. So you want to stand out to the legislator that you're talking to. Thank you so much, Senator. Great, great insights. Assemblywoman, how, how about you? What, what are some of the things you're looking for in a, in a meeting? So, so a couple of things um, and to Senator Knope's point, uh, finances matter. Uh, what's it going to cost us? Uh, New Jersey, we're at looking at a $49 billion budget this term uh, and where people wanted flat budgets. Adam, you, you remember this, they now want double. <laughs> right to support their different causes and initiatives because the state has money. Uh, but a another cheating fact that I have is I also worked as a lobbyist in the healthcare space prior to uh, joining the legislature. I'm looking for a one page cheat sheet. As uh, the Senator mentioned, we are hearing uh, from so many different people. There are so many voices in our ears and so many issues that are paramount. New Jersey's 9 million people that we're trying to cover. Leave me with the cheat sheet so I can read later and process uh, the information and connect and humanize 
the issue by the patient testimony, uh, and then I can have a better argument. If I can't explain it to my colleagues, I darn sure can't advocate for it. So it's important to break down the complex issues uh, so that we can uh, advocate within our caucuses respectfully. And sometimes, a lot of times with healthcare, it's bipartisan. That's the great thing about healthcare. Healthcare doesn't know a party uh, because disease doesn't know a party affiliation. Uh, so that's the nice thing when we're looking at these type of issues because we really can work collaboratively for the health of our individual states and population. Thank, thank you so much, Assemblywoman. And Senator Fine, you know, we'll, we'll end this with you. You know, what are the one or two things that you really seek when, when, when speaking to advocates? When an advocate comes into my office, I first want them to remember that I'm human too, uh, because many times people feel uh, intimidated by approaching somebody who's been elected. But I'm your friend, I'm your neighbor, I'm your family member. And in order to get something done that might benefit you or benefit the people around you, we have to have this conversation. And what really resonates with me is that personal story. So here's what the bill is, but there, this is how it will affect me personally. Uh, a quick example, uh, a couple of years ago, we were able to pass an Illinois non-medical switching. And I had a woman come into my office with her daughter and her daughter had severe epilepsy and would have hundreds and hundreds of seizures a week. And they told me about how if her medication had been switched, if her insurance no longer covered her medication, what that would do to her life uh, now that she's finally been stabilized. And to this day, I could remember that conversation in my office because then I personalized it. I thought, what if that were my child? And how can we help this family? Family and anybody else like this family. And so I think that the human factor and just really personalizing how something that might seem complex can really help people get to that point across. Thank you, Senator. I, I think we, we heard a, a lot of great tips and information. And something that the Assemblywoman uh, hit on is, you know, we, we talk about advocates coming to, to our offices but as, as legislators, we've got to be advocates as well. You know, at whether, when we're sponsoring bills and we're trying to get our colleagues to join us, uh, you know, when we're trying to get our constituents to vote us back into office, we're, we're often advocating for, for different things. So I want to ask the question of, of, of our legislator panelists, what are some of the tips and tricks that you use when you're, when you're an advocate trying to get other folks to support a position that you're on? Do you you know, we heard about the patient stories again. We heard about, you know, uh, Senator uh, Knope talk about facts and figures. What are the, what do you have in your tool belt when you're trying to get other folks on board with an issue that you're supporting? And we'll start with the Assemblywoman on this question. Sure. So uh, in, in, in my toolkit in Arsenal uh, is a good old fashioned telephone, picking up a phone. Uh, and actually calling uh, my colleagues to support the effort uh, for a bill uh, that I'm champion and let them know why. Uh, if it's someone in my district uh, or if it's a statewide issue that we just didn't have our eyes on it because we were dealing with so many other issues that were a crisis uh, and had the fires that you know, needed to be put out. Uh, but really the personal contact to remind them to please just take a read uh, because it's important that our legislators know what they're voting on. I think that's important and that's part of the job as well. Um, and then also talking to my constituents. Thank God for technology because we're able to do the email blast. This is what I'm working on. I need your help to push this over the hump. If I don't get it done, I, I'm a two term uh, person in the state of New Jersey. If it does not pass in that session, I have to start over again. Clock starts ticking again for the next session. So time is essential and we really don't have it to waste, especially if it's something uh, valuable, such as uh, cost saving access to uh, medications and drugs in our state for rare diseases. We wanna make sure that we are no longer uh, having people to wait for life-saving treatment uh, where we really can have a remedy if we all focus on it. So I'm not afraid to do the hard work, roll up my sleeves, get in the ring, and you know this, Adam, uh, because it's that important to the lives of the people of my state. Thank you, Assemblywoman. So that, that, that touch point, you know, those constant touch points with your legislators and as advocates is, 
is certainly very important. And, and Senator Fine, how about yourself? When you know when you when you're advocating on an issue, you know what what are some of the, the, the tips that you would suggest? So my father-in-law used to always say to me, "You have." two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, you need to always listen. And many times I'll have a piece of legislation that to me seems perfect and everything is in place. But then when I talk to my colleagues about it, they'll bring up some concerns that they have. And those concerns will make sense to me. So now you have to work around what those concerns are. And it might be uh, changing your piece of legislation a bit. But just because you have to change it to compromise doesn't mean that you're losing. It means that you're trying to find the sweet spot where that bill will actually, you know, pass. In Illinois, we say you need 3061, 30 votes in the Senate, 60 votes in the House, and then the governor's signature. So if you can't have people on board with what you're doing, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything. So just like the assemblywoman said, we have to talk to all of our colleagues. We have to explain what the legislation does. And then we have to listen to see if we need to make changes to make sure that we can pass that piece of legislation. Thank, thank you. And uh, I think you, you hit the nail on the head and spoke, spoke on so many different topics that as advocates, we can certainly learn from. And, and Senator uh, Knope, um, can you just, you know, round this out with, you know, what, what are your uh, strategies when you're trying to get your, your fellow colleagues on board with an issue that you're supporting? Adam, it's a really great question. I mean, first of all, like if I was going to go see uh, Senator Fine, a member of the Democrat Party, I would, of course, wear my uh, replica ring from the World Championship Cubs of 1908, because clearly Senator Fine has to be a Cubs fan. How could she vote against another Cub fan? Um, she couldn't. So we would have to have this bipartisan, you know, moment, right? And so really that's what it's about. It's creating those relationships and connecting on other issues and trying to figure out where we can work together. And as uh, the good representative said, um, healthcare doesn't have a party, you know, it's personal to us. And so, uh, you know, when we have a, a, a relative, a family member, uh, a friend who has an issue, um, we personalize it just like everyone else does. And so, you know, when, when I'm trying to connect with somebody on an issue, I try to find those commonalities. And so, you know, I'll talk to them about that particular issue and uh, try to figure out those connect points uh, where we're gonna be able to move forward. And I've done so much good bipartisan legislation, uh, both in healthcare and uh, just generally in the legislature over uh, the 15 plus years that I've been in the legislature because it takes both sides. I've been in the majority, I've been in the minority. Uh, the majority is much more fun, by the way. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, it, it takes everyone because, you know, your, you know, your adversary in the morning is your advocate in the afternoon. And so you don't burn bridges, you know, you just keep working on those relationships and figure out where you can create those uh, commonalities of interest and, uh, you know, where you can work together uh, to get really good things done for the people of your state. Senator uh, Knope, you, you bring up so many uh, great ideas. And, and we, the, the theme that we heard from all of our legislators was just, you know, the, the, the thought of commonalities and, and listening and, and trying to find where we can come together. And, and I, I love the, 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 the idea that the Senator just mentioned around, you know, the, 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 the Cubs ring. You know, when you walk into a legislator's office, it's a great idea to look around, look on the walls. You know, if you look behind me, I've, in my legislative office, when I had one, I had, you know, Penn State stuff on the wall. There's so many advocates that will come in and say, hey, you know, I went to Penn State too. And whenever you find that commonality with the legislator, that kind of eases the, the meeting and it and creates that, that commonality that, that we all spoke about. So I think those are, are, are fantastic tips for anyone looking to get engaged. So I want to I want to shift gears a little bit here. And it was a mistake that I often made when I first got involved in advocacy. I would, I would be so excited to meet with a legislator. I would get to the meeting and the legislator wasn't there. It, it, was, just, it was the staffer. And I would say, ah, you know what? This is a, you know, a waste of meeting because I'm just meeting with the staffer. I couldn't have been more wrong. Can you talk to me about how you use your staffers, the value of advocates meeting with staffers and why it's so important to, to, to 
build relationships with, with you know, the, the staffers that we all uh, rely upon. And I'll start with you, Senator Fine. Can you speak to the the the, the power of, uh, you know, meeting with a, a staffer and how it's just as important and sometimes more important than meeting with the actual member? Absolutely. So I consider my staffer as my partner, um, kind of like my right arm. And there are many times, especially if we're in Springfield, I'm one person and we're running all over the place. And if you have um, my chief of staff, Ben Isbell, if you have his ear, then you have my ear. And that is so important to remember. We'd love to meet with absolutely everyone we can, but we are not clones. And sometimes it, it is important that that staffer comes into play. And you know you have a good staffer when you finish each other's sentences. <laughs> so I know if I have a thought process in mind and I get stuck, He'll finish that sentence for me and we'll work on that legislation together. So it really is a partnership um, and that's how we can get it done for, for more people throughout the state. Thank you, Senator. And Senator Cano, how about you with, with your staff? Uh, talk about the, the value of, of advocates working with your staff. Yeah, so critical. So um, how you treat staff is going to determine what your success level is because uh, those staff are the link to the legislator. And so if you treat them poorly, uh, the chances of you having success are not going to be very good because we rely on them for virtually everything. You know, I know that we all take credit for what happens, but at the end of the day, uh, their hard work from the staff is what really allows us to be able to do what we do. And we can't meet with every single person Although I do tell people I'm probably the easiest meeting in the Oregon legislature. So I meet with everybody. Uh, and that's, I think that's another key to success is it doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on. It doesn't matter what party you're in, um, especially if you're a constituent, moving you to the front of the line, bumping the lobbyists out, you can meet with them anytime. Uh, but, you know, constituents uh, go to the front of the line and uh, whether that's a meeting with staff or whether that's a meeting with me, um, you want to make sure that you're treating those staff people uh, with respect and, and doing the little nice things, you know, the thank you notes and uh, whatever uh, to um, make sure that they understand. And the same thing applies to them. Look around, look in their work, you know, workspace. Don't stalk them, but look at their workspace and see what is actually there because whatever is meaningful to them is probably going to be there, whether that's a picture of family or their pet or you know, their Cubs uh, pennant, whatever it happens to be. Um, and um, again, try to connect with them the same way you're connecting with the legislator. Thank you so much, so much, Senator. And, and Assemblywoman, how, how about you? How do, how do you utilize your staff? And, and you know, what's their importance with, uh, you know, meeting with advocates as well? All right, I just have to say, go Yankees. <laughs> 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 just on principle <laughs> for my location <laughs> uh, but but truly uh, my, my staff uh, they're my uh, left brain uh, if you will there is no way I could retain all of the information that's coming out of me out of a fire hydrant uh, at a fast pace uh, to sift through and determine what's a priority in that moment uh, to refocus me a voting session day can have upwards of 200 bills and everything's important. And, and as I said, as much as we like to have a conscious and, and vote our conscious and make sure uh, it's respectful of the members uh, where that information comes from, it takes staff to really focus and say, hey, this is important. Put it in front of you. Remember uh, this constituent was concerned about it. Remember this small business um, will be impacted by it. Uh, remember this legislator, um, it was a passion for them and they actually spoke to you about it because it's 200 pieces of legislation um, that you're trying to vote on and you know really have an impact with. Uh, so I can't say enough about the staff and my mom was a secretary. So it's those gatekeepers, those courtesies um, that really can get your phone call through to the legislator or get your idea through. I love when people call and say, nope, I only have to talk to her. It's, it, I can't talk to anyone else. Our staff are confidential. We help people with housing, uh, with social service supports. 
uh, through the pandemic, we helped them, and Adam, you know this, with unemployment, very sensitive information. Uh, so it's important that we have staff that protects that. I can tell you, we went out to dinner the other night, my husband and I with some friends, and literally as I walked through the door, and members, you'd appreciate this, there were folks there that I knew in the restaurant because we hadn't been out in a while, and they came up, whispered in my ear, thank you for helping me with my unemployment. Thank you for helping my son with their unemployment. But they whispered in my ear. You know, sometimes you got to be worried, okay, is this a friendly hug or is it a, you know, you didn't do what I wanted you to do hug. <laughs> you know, uh, that grip can change. But having that access, that staff who will take care, stay on the follow-up with the different departments in the state, motor vehicle, all of those things, critical. Thank you, Assemblywoman. I think we it has been heard loud and clear that the, the, the staff is an invaluable component to, to any advocacy effort. And, and as you heard our, our members say, you know, are often the gatekeepers can help you get to the front of the line, you know, when you're trying to have that meeting. And I, I can say this now that I'm out the legislator, out of, out of the legislature, there were times when I couldn't read every bill. And, you know, we're coming to the floor to vote on a specific bill. And I will call my chief of staff over and say, hey, um, you know, how, how are we uh, looking to vote on this bill? And he, he would kind of guide me on, on, on which way to vote. So it, it even gets to that point where, uh, you know, that staffer is the, the, the beacon of information uh, for, for all of us. So, so thank you so much to our, our legislators for those uh, remarks. So we, we've got about 10 more minutes before we go to the audience for, for questions and, and, and a question and answer session. But I do have a, a couple more questions I want to ask you. So I'm going to hurry it up on my end. Uh, over the last over the pandemic, the last couple of years, you know, we've the state houses, some of our state houses have been closed to the public. And it has really heightened the, the need and urgency for social media uh, engagement from, from an advocacy perspective. Um, it, you know, the, the use of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all these other means. Can you speak to, 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 to all of us today about how you engage with advocates over social media? Do you think social media is a viable way to, to interact with you all in, in your policymaking efforts and just how you know your staff uh, uh, utilizes the different uh, social media platforms out there? So uh, Senator Knope, can I, can I begin with you? And can you, you know, speak to the, the, the value of uh, social media and, and advocacy, how you use it to engage with uh, advocates? Yes. Um... I think it has been very important, especially over the last two years with COVID. Uh, of course, um, a lot of our meetings have been by Zoom or some other format um, uh, of online meetings and uh, getting points across on social media. So whether that's uh, uh, the Twitter or uh, Facebook or Instagram, what have you, I, we probably all use it. Um, to make sure that we're, uh, again, trying to connect with people in a way that we could uh, during COVID. And so uh, I do think it's a valuable platform, especially uh, what I tell people is uh, try to be positive. So all my social media or almost all of it is positive. I rarely say a negative thing uh, on my social media and I encourage people to do the same thing. So if you're gonna interact with a legislator, on social media, interact in a positive way. Because you know what? We get enough criticism. Um, so uh, we probably don't need yours. And so uh, that's the truth. It's just this job is getting harder and harder. And you know it's getting more vile. And social media is kind of driving that. Because people will say things on social media that they will not say to your face. Mm -hmm. And they'll make all kinds of claims on social media. And so. The more accurate you are, the more positive you are, the more supportive you are, uh, quite frankly, the more interested we're going to be in trying to work out that issue. And so um, social media is a great way to be able to do that in a positive way. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblywoman, how, how about you? How do, how do you, you and your office utilize social media to engage with advocates? So uh, during the pandemic, especially, uh, we had no uh, other options. So social media really became the conduit to alert 
uh, individuals to what was available to, to them to for our business communities to see the different programs and resources that could support them uh, for uh, COVID testing sites, vaccination sites, uh, because the state sites uh, didn't have capacity. Uh, so we became that trusted source. Uh, so there really was no room for, I'm going to say, gaming in that space. Social media uh, really became a tool. Uh, in fact, during the pandemic, I used social media for wellness videos, health tips on how to cope with uh, now having your home uh, become your office in the, the classroom, uh, shared space with your spouse. Uh, my husband and I had spent so much time together uh, in the entirety of the 20 years married. I, I did say, thank God I like you, right? <laughs> so uh, we really learned uh, more about each other. We were able to have dinner together, uh, but we were also communicating more with our kids. Our college son uh, was home um, and frustrated with us because he couldn't be on a college campus. And I talked to moms uh, who set up different social groups online to support each other uh, through the pandemic for their own wellness of really being confined to a space and having many hats that were all important. Um, more importantly, uh, for social media responsibility, as I said, I have a 23-year-old and a 22-year-old son uh, who follow me. So when someone would say they didn't like X about me, they would take it personal. And I had to have those conversations with my kids. Like, look, you know, so, sometimes you're just going to have to ignore it. If, you, if it's too much for you, don't follow it, you know, just you know, stand down, please stand down. Mom, mom can handle it um, and, you know, respond appropriately or not respond at all because yeah. every message does not deserve a response. Our offices were closed. So responding to the uh, direct messages, the DMs in all of these spaces, my staff had to get up to speed on that as well because we weren't in the office. We didn't have voicemail forwarding to our home phones or cell phones. So literally, we didn't even have uh, computers in our office that could uh, have video capacity. We just got them towards the end of what, September, Adam, I believe, September, yes. October. So we had to use our personal devices uh, just for meeting space and virtual meetings. So literally it brought us into the 21st era as legislators uh, with the pandemic. So using these tools responsibly became really another connector for us with the constituencies and their needs. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And we'll end this question with, with Senator Fine. Can you uh, talk to us about how you guys utilize uh, social media. Sure. So my office uses social media to communicate. Uh, you know, I, just as the assemblywoman was saying, especially during the pandemic, um, how to apply for any ARPA dollars, any unemployment, um, you know, where there are sites in the area. We put our newsletter on social media. Uh, so we use it as a way to communicate out. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I don't go on social media and read comments because I found during the pandemic, uh, People who don't live in my community, don't live in my state possibly, uh, were getting pretty ugly on social media. And I felt like that was overshadowing the job that needed to get done. So when I respond to my constituents, and I, I guess my situation's a little bit different because during the pandemic, uh, we had email, we had our, our phones forwarded. So we, were, we didn't miss any of those phone calls or any of those communications. So I really look for communications from my constituents on, um, on those issues through them reaching out and actually contacting me uh, and not contacting me through social media. Thank, thank you. And all, all helpful uh, insights. And we've got about five minutes here before we go to the audience for questions and answers. And we spoke a lot today about what we want advocates to do. You know, reach out to us, tell you your stories. But I think it's also helpful to talk to advocates about what, what we don't want them to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll give a quick example. When I was a legislator, I would always, my pet peeve would be when someone would come to, to my office and they would complain about an issue. And I would say, well, you know, how do you propose for us to fix it? And they wouldn't have, there would be no answer. It would just say, I'm not happy about this issue. I just want you to know about it. And I would get, that would be my pet peeve saying, you know, why are you coming to meet with me to tell me what you don't like if you're not going to help me help you 
fix the issue. And I, I'm relying on you to help me fix this issue. Is there one thing that comes to mind that, you know, that you say, I, I wish advocates wouldn't do that, or I wish they would help me with X, Y, or Z. Can you, in, the, in the, the four or five minutes that we have here, can you speak to, you know, one or two things that you would like advocates to change when they come to, to see you? And we'll start with the assembly woman on this question. Uh, two, two things really, really quick. Uh, don't offer to do the work of my staff. And the, the second thing is, don't assume that I will remember your issue if you do not want to leave me with any documentation. Very well said, Assemblywoman. Uh, Senator Fine, how about you? This is going to sound funny, but I mean it sincerely. Don't follow me to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because many times we will have people come down here and we're busy all day long um, and we really want to meet with our constituents. But if you walk with me to the bathroom, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Senator, and well taken. And uh, uh, Senator Knope, how about you? What are, what are some things that you are, are no-nos in, in your world? Uh, well, thank you, Adam. Uh, one of them was mentioned earlier, and that was... Uh, uh, one sheet, bullet points, do not drop all your research on me. You know, this big, thick packet. Uh, I, I'm not going to have time to do it. I'm just not going to have time to go through it. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we got to read all the bills. And sometimes you can't even do that. And so mm -hmm. the idea that we're going to read, you know, 14 volumes of research uh, on your issue, not going to happen. Um, so... People say, you know, uh, where should I put this? You should take it with you. Uh, you know, don't leave it with me because uh, it looks like a bomb went off in my office already. I don't need, you know, that much more stuff. Um, so I, I think that's one of the most critical things. And also, I think you mentioned the number one, have a solution. Uh, oh, there's all kinds of problems. All the problems that haven't been solved are difficult problems because they, you know, just because they haven't been solved yet, that should tell you that they're difficult. There is no silver bullet to a lot of these issues, whether it's healthcare or what have you. Uh, they're super complicated and uh, it takes uh, a lot of time usually to, to get them done. So um, you gotta have patience. So I, I, those are my kind of tips on that. Well, thank, thank you. And uh, so to, to our audience, you, you heard it here first directly from our legislators on, on some of the things that uh, you know they, they, they aren't fans of, but you know, the most important thing is to continue to reach out to, to your, your public officials because we all, and I keep saying we, I'm, I'm no longer a legislator, but our, our legislators truly want to hear from you. So with that being said, we have had some members of the audience that have reached out with a, a few questions that I want to pose to, to the panel and would love to uh, get, get your feedback on. Uh, one of our questions from, from the audience is, you know, when advocating, is it better to first go to your legislator, you know, that you, you know, as a constituent, or is it better to go to the legislator that has at least expressed interest in your particular issue? What, what would be your advice there? Uh, Senator uh, Kano, could we start with you on that uh, question? Yeah, I would say go to your legislator first, even if they're not the expert or they're not on that particular committee. Um, the last thing you want to have happen is you go to that expert or that person on the committee and they come to talk to that legislator from your district and they go, I don't even know who that is uh, or what this issue is about. That, um, that kind of deflates your issue right out of the gate. Uh, so to build credibility, start with your legislator and get their advice about uh, where to go next. Uh, because sometimes uh, going to a committee chair or uh, something like that has ramifications for us as members as well. Uh, so if, our constituent is going and uh, advocating to them, um, you know, they, that could be uh, cause issues for us as well. So the fact that we know that that's gonna happen or that we set that up uh, and uh, make it happen, I think is the um, best way to handle it. Th thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblywoman, uh, Senator Fine, do you, any of you have uh, anything to add to that? No, no, truly, uh, because most times a member is going to ask us, do you know that person? Have you heard of this issue? So it's validation 
uh, to uplift it. And if not, then it goes to the back burner if you've jumped those steps and gone to a committee chairperson uh, for the issue. Thank you, Senator Miller. Uh, another question that we got is, um, can you all speak to the importance of coalitions in, in the work that you do, specifically, um, you know, broad buy-in around a solution to an issue? You know, do you, do you consider coalition work more important than having a, you know, a single advocate come and uh, speak to you about an issue? Uh, uh, Senator Fine, can you, can you uh, speak to that a little bit for us? Coalitions are extremely helpful, especially if you have a piece of legislation that has um, a coalition that usually doesn't work together. Uh, for example, I have a bill that's in committee today, and it's uh, supported by um, not only many of the, the healthcare advocates, but the um, environmental associations, the retail manufacturers association, the pharmaceutical companies. And so there are many times that you'll have somebody who has, you know, interest in the environment or interest in healthcare, and this brings everybody together. And so this is a, a drug take back bill that is, you know, yeah. going to protect not only human health, but environmental health. And so it gets a lot of attention if you have that diverse coalition supporting a piece of legislation. Thank you, Senator. That, that is helpful. And Assemblywoman, uh, and Senator Knope, any, anything from your sides on that around coalitions? Okay, one, actually I've received this question a couple times in, in the chat here. And it says, do email communications have more, less, or equal value to a phone call? When you receive an email, you know, where does that go in the pecking order? Uh, as far as you know, responsiveness and and, and getting back to an advocate on a specific issue. Uh, how about you, Assemblywoman Sumter? You know, email communication the equal value to it than a phone call or an in person meeting. Equal value um, if uh, it's of uh, interest um, and if the request is there to set up a meeting, then the office is going to follow through. They're going to contact the individual, find out more detail, uh, and then set up the meeting. But it really um, again, back when it was mailing a letter, so emails a lot quicker um, to at least get a response and we check them daily. So um, it has a lot of value today. Thank you. Um, got another question here. It's pretty, it's actually, it's a, it's a two part question. And the question is, if we're not able to reach the legislator directly, or his or her staff, and we, instead we, you know, we leave a message over the phone or send an email. What's in a re, what's a reasonable time, in your opinion, to expect to hear back from you or your staff? You know, is it, they, I know it could vary, but it, what would be a reasonable time for an advocate when they reach out to to hear back from a, a, a legislator? Uh, any of our panelists willing to, uh, to 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 tackle that one? Sure, I think there's a lot of. Um, ifs that go along with that. Um, first, if, are we in session? Because if we're in session, it's going to take longer to get back to somebody because we're, you know, not only us, but our staffs are, are extremely busy. If you just leave a message saying, I'm so-and-so, and this is what my issue is, then we might feel like, well, they've already told us what they're talking about. Maybe it doesn't need a call back. But if you leave a message saying, I'd like to talk to you about something, then you're going to get a call back. So really, the ifs there are, how specific are you with what that message might be or what that email might be? Um, if you send us a form email, you're most likely going to get a form email back. Uh, because we get hundreds of those emails. If you send us your personal story, that's different, and that's going to stand out a whole lot more, and we'll we'll respond to that. And if you set up an appointment to meet us, especially in the district and not at the Capitol, we'll take the time, and then we'll really get to know each other. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. And, and the, the second part of that question. Hold on, Adam, know. if oh, I may. Absolutely. Uh, because back to, to the earlier question, my chief of staff texted me to let everyone know, send an email and then call to follow up. Her name is Judith Fanella. She is in the chat and she's giving me directions <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thank you. Judith is fantastic. Um, and and the, the second part to that question, and again, I think it, it could be very variable, but what is the best time to call your offices to reach you or your staff? Is there a time, is, you know, mornings? Uh, does it vary? 
can any of our, our panelists speak to if, if, if there is a good time or good time not to call your offices? So Adam, for me, uh, I set my office up um, as a work workplace. So we're open nine to five, Monday through Friday. Uh, it was important to me being a healthcare executive that we were responsive uh, just as a patient advocate would in a hospital system that's, uh, you know, where a person may have uh, trouble and needs to troubleshoot. Uh, so any person that I've hired uh, for our office, they know that I'm responsible uh, to my constituencies. The last thing I want to hear uh, when I'm in the supermarket is I've called you, you didn't call me back. Um, I sent you an email, you didn't respond. Uh, even if it is a no. So even if I have to say no, um, I try to be that conscientious to my constituency because that's why they elected me. Thank you, Senator Bowman. I think this is a really interesting question. Um, as members of the legislature, you know, when you're meeting with advocates, do you, do you prefer to meet with advocates one-on-one -on -one, or you, do you prefer if there's advocates all on the same issue that they all come meet with you in one meeting. Do you have a preference on, on, on those type of meetings? Uh, you know, Adam, I think it kind of depends, really. Um, if it's uh, the main advocate for that, I think you're going to want to meet with them probably ahead of time. Um, you know, large meetings, we probably still have, honestly, the same amount of time. If you're in session, it's 15 minutes. If you're getting 30 minutes, uh, you should be amazed and considered a miracle. If you get an hour, um, uh, that's the holy grail. Uh, you know, so we, um, if you have 20 advocates in a meeting that's 15 minutes, it's not going to be that easy for them to convey that information. And not everybody's going to get a chance to speak. And sometimes that leads to hard, you know, hard feelings. And, uh, you know, so uh, I would say probably smaller groups as opposed to uh, to bigger groups as it relates to advocacy, you know, two or three, four, something like that probably works well. I I do a lot better one-on-one -on -one or in smaller groups than I do in, in larger groups, but, you know, I'll do them. I've done them all, um, but I think the most effective ones are, quite frankly, the smaller groups where you can begin to connect with your legislator. And, and Adam, I try to limit meetings on session days. Uh, because my staff knows I'm not focused. It, it's, you know, the bills before me, uh, I'm trying to, you know, learn uh, what's a priority, what the Republican caucus may be opposing, uh, if I have to prepare for floor debate uh, on a bill that I'm passionate about. So uh, my, my staff has learned that my mind is just not as sharp. Um, it's, you know, very cluttered on a session day versus a non-session day. Uh, to meet with advocates. And if I meet with a large group, um, again, I'm still expecting uh, there to be a couple of people uh, who are going to lead uh, the discussion and not, you know, 30 people saying the same thing uh, because I am sharp enough to get it on the first three times. <laughs> All right, thank you, Assemblywoman. So we, we've got about five, we've got about five minutes left here. And if I could ask each of you, I've got one final question. Uh, just to share your, your uh, for a minute or so, share your response. Any advice for advocates looking to get engaged in policy? As, as, a, as a sitting legislator, what is your best piece of advice for anyone, for any advocates looking to get engaged in, in policy and making their voices heard? Uh, how about Senator Fine? Can we start with you on that one? Sure. Uh, do it because you're the ones who can make a difference. And I believe the assemblywoman said it earlier, we are presented with hundreds of bills and hundreds of ideas every year. But if there's something that's important to you and you know is gonna help other people, it's in my opinion, it's your responsibility to step up so we can hear you and we can work together to get it done. Thank you, Senator. Uh, assemblywoman. Absolutely. Don't take it for granted. The, the one myth is that someone else has done it already. That's and, and I've made that mistake. They must know this because this is a really big deal. Uh, and, and truth be told, even if we knew it had an inkling 
there's been so much more that's come at us full speed. I said water out of a fire hydrant uh, that it is not in front of our view. Uh, so please shine a spotlight on it uh, so that we can begin to address it. Because I believe um, a couple of us mentioned that these things, if it's a good change, it takes time and we need to find out who all the opponents are and why. Uh, if it's a structural issue, a federal partnership, uh, a dynamic that we just, you know, is unforeseen to us exposing it to us and helping us to do the research and work on it is the only way that these things get done in a you know democratic society thank you so much assemblywoman and, and we'll, we'll wrap with senator canope any any last words of advice for advocates looking to get engaged in policy yeah what i would say is start by coming to a town hall mm -hmm. and you know there's lots of citizens that typically come uh, you know you can engage with your legislator most of us hang around before or after and talk to constituents in a pretty informal way. And um, I would say start there. And usually our staff is somewhere nearby uh, during those and gives you an opportunity to connect with them as well. So if I was going to start on policy, that's probably where I would start. Thank you uh, so much for that advice. And I would be remiss if I just, on behalf of our audience today, on behalf of my colleagues at, at, at Bristol Myers, thank you to our, our legislative panelists for your time today. We, we know how valuable your time is, uh, you know, certainly during sessions, how, how crazy it is for each and every one of you. And for you all to take an hour of your time to share your insights and tips for, for all of us that are looking to be better advocates, we just wanna say thank you. We know you don't do your work to be thanked, but uh, thank you so much. And to, to the audience watching today, for those that are advocates out there, thank you for the work that you do on behalf of patients uh, each and every day. Because as you heard from our legislator panelists, your voice is truly important in the work that policymakers do each and every day. And, and to my, my colleagues at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, as you heard from our, our head of corporate affairs, Michelle Weiss, uh, thank you for your words today. Our Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, thank you for her recording. And, all right, for, on behalf of our entire U.S. policy and government affairs team led by Stephanie Dyson, uh, thank you so much for making today possible. And, and we certainly look forward to having continued dialogue with our, our legislators uh, and the work that we do. So without further ado, we want to thank you for joining us today. And we will certainly be having more policy forums and talking about more advocacy related agenda items as we go forward. So hope everyone has a great rest of their day. To our policymakers again, thank you so much and God bless you in the work that you do each and every day. Thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Have a great day, everybody.